guys, it's Kayla and Jim. Welcome back to another Meteorology Monday. Today we are going to be covering a very interesting topic, but before we get into that, we have just hit 6,000 of you subscribed here on YouTube, which is an insane number for the two of us who just sit here and make videos about weather and we never thought that we would reach that number. So we wanted to take a minute to say, if you're new around here, thank you so much for subscribing and joining the Meteotech Weather family. And if you've been here for a while, as I know a bunch of you have, thanks for sticking around and supporting us all these years. With that, what are we talking about today? Today, we are going to talk about the April 27th, 2011 Tuscaloosa and Birmingham tornado. So this tornado is actually a part of the super outbreak of 2011, which had a record breaking 360 tornadoes stretching from the Northeastern United States all the way to the deep South in Texas, and even one reported tornado in Ontario, Canada. And this super outbreak actually lasted over a span of about three days or so, but the tornado we're gonna specifically look at actually occurred toward the end of the event on April 27th. As with all of our other tornado case studies, we do a meteorological setup before diving into the storm specifically. So let's look at the overall meteorological setup for this event. As early as Saturday, April 23rd, 2011, forecasters were seeing ingredients coming together to produce a major severe weather outbreak across the Arklatex region on day four, April 26th, and the Ohio, Tennessee Valley, and deep south on day five, April 27th. Forecast models were predicting a strong jet stream to carve out a deep trough over the Rockies with a mid-level shortwave quickly developing and strengthening by April 26th. At the surface, a stationary front was draped from the Ohio Valley southwestward toward the Oklahoma, Texas region. By the morning of the 26th, a strong low pressure system developed over eastern Iowa in response to the mid-level shortwave and strong jet approaching the area. As ingredients such as abundant low-level moisture, strong wind shear, and a strengthening cold front to force large-scale ascent came together, the Storm Prediction Center issued their early afternoon day two prediction, valid from 6 a.m. Central Daylight Time on April 27th through 6 a.m. Central Daylight Time on April 28th, indicating a moderate risk of severe weather, including strong tornadoes rated EF2 or higher, and widespread damaging winds would be felt from the deep south northward into the Ohio Valley. This risk would be upgraded to a high risk on the morning of April 27th with their associated mesoscale discussion stating a dangerous tornado outbreak capable of producing several violent and long-tracked EF4 tornadoes or stronger was expected. As the day progressed, the right entrance region of the jet stream moved overhead, aiding in significant rising motion. Lower level turning of the winds would create an atmosphere ripe for long-lived, long-tracked supercells many of which would go on to produce strong to violent tornadoes that day. In fact, just before 12 p.m. Central Daylight Time, the Storm Prediction Center increased the probability of tornadoes within 25 miles of a location, including the Tuscaloosa area, to 45%. This level even exceeds the typical standards defining a high-risk event. And again, if you want to learn more about the super outbreak in its entirety, go ahead and check out our other case study, which will be linked up here. Now let's take a look at the storm specifics for that storm that moved through Tuscaloosa and Birmingham, Alabama. As the afternoon of April 27th progressed, the air mass was very unstable across Alabama. Cape values estimated between 2,500 and 4,000 joules per kilogram were experienced as surface dew point temperatures rose between 70 and 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Wind shear between 80 and 100 knots at the mid-level, as well as a strong cold front, were encroaching upon the area as well. A particularly dangerous situation, or PDS tornado watch, was issued for much of Alabama, northwest Georgia, southeast Mississippi, and southern middle Tennessee. Within the PDS watch, there was a greater than 95% chance of at least two tornadoes and one or more strong tornadoes. 
Around 2.54 p.m. Central Daylight Time, a supercell thunderstorm developed over Newton County, Mississippi. Around 3.09 p.m. Central Daylight Time, the National Weather Service in Jackson, Mississippi, issued the first tornado warning on the supercell that would eventually produce the Tuscaloosa-Birmingham tornado. The tornado initially touched down in rural northern Greene County and moved northeast towards southern Tuscaloosa and western Jefferson counties. Look at that. Goodness gracious. This will be a day that will go down in state history. According to the Birmingham, Alabama National Weather Service Storm Report, the tornado entered Tuscaloosa County just north of County Road 60, west-northwest of Ralph, and moved northeast causing tree damage and minor structural damage consistent with an EF2 rating and winds of 125 miles per hour. The tornado strengthened as it crossed the Black Warrior River north of Interstate 20 and approached Tuscaloosa to a violent EF4 with winds of 170 miles per hour. This is a large, violent tornado coming up on downtown Tuscaloosa. Be in a safe place right now. As the tornado approached Interstate 359, several buildings were destroyed, including the Tuscaloosa County Emergency Operations Center. Along 15th Street East and McFarland Boulevard East, several small restaurants and stores were destroyed, with only a wall or two still standing. The tornado devastated the Cedar Crest neighborhood just north of 15th Street leveling many cinder block homes and causing at least three fatalities. The tornado crossed McFarland Boulevard where it destroyed additional stores and restaurants. The tornado crossed University Boulevard in the Alberta City community. Alberta Elementary School suffered nearly complete destruction with only a few portions of walls still standing. A nearby two-story apartment building was reduced to rubble sitting on the foundation. The Alberta Park Shopping Center was completely destroyed with no wall standing and a pile of debris on the foundation. Cinder block construction homes in the surrounding neighborhood were completely destroyed. And in a few cases, debris was swept away from the site. The tornado continued northeast and struck the Chastain Manor Apartments at the north end of 34th Ave East. Buildings on the east side of this new two-story apartment complex were completely destroyed with only a pile of debris remaining and a few walls set into the hillside. A small clubhouse that was anchored to a foundation but with apparently no interior walls was completely destroyed and swept from its foundation. Similar devastation to homes and businesses was noted along both sides of County Route 45 near 1st Street East and locations to the northeast. This thing looks like it might be over one half mile wide, uh, maybe up to three quarters of a mile wide. East of Holt, the tornado path width widened from half a mile to around one mile. The tornado crossed Holt-Peterson Road, just northwest of Clinker Road, where two homes were completely destroyed. One home on a foundation was swept clean, with only floor joists remaining attached to the foundation. Almost all trees were blown down or snapped in this vicinity, as well as the bottom of a narrow ravine nearly 100 feet below the house. The tornado continued to Holt Lock and Dam Road. Numerous mobile homes and several cinder block homes were destroyed in this area. The tornado continued northeastward and weakened to an EF3 rating with winds of 130 miles per hour. As its path narrowed to half a mile, the tornado passed north of Brookwood near the intersection of Hannah Creek Road and County Road 59. Several mobile homes were destroyed, cinder block homes received heavy damage, and significant tree damage was noted in this area. The tornado moved parallel to Hannah Creek Road, where it caused extensive tree damage and destroyed at least one mobile home. The tornado crossed County Road 99 and moved into western Jefferson County, four miles north of Aberdeen. In the Concord area, the tornado became violent once again, with total destruction noted to a few small retail shops along County Road 46. Only piles of debris were left on the foundation. In addition, several cinder block homes were completely destroyed with debris swept away. Numerous other homes in the area were destroyed with only a few interior walls left standing. The tornado continued northeastward out of the Concord area and into the Pleasant Grove community. It looks like, uh, Greg, the mesocyclone may be right down almost on the ground. It's amazing. Wow. 
Yeah, that's what we think, Jeff, that this has gotten uh, basically so strong that the, the wall cloud uh, is all the way to the ground and the tornado is embedded in it. The two have basically just merged into one big, strong, rotating storm. EF4 damage was prevalent here, with slabs wiped clean, though the debris from each house had not been removed by the winds. The majority of it remained within a couple yards of the home. It was here in Pleasant Grove where evidence of vehicles being moved by the winds became obvious, though most were only tossed 10 to 15 yards, if they were picked up at all. Additionally, wind rowing of debris was evident through the Pleasant Grove community, which is characteristic of a storm of this magnitude. The tornado quickly moved out of the Pleasant Grove area and into the McDonald Chapel community. It was here in McDonald Chapel where evidence of a slight weakening of the tornado became clear. No vehicles were tossed, only pushed slightly from their original position. Many homes in this area were constructed by the method of pier and beam foundation, which led to some of the major destruction, as this construction will not withstand winds of this magnitude. A four-sided brick home in the same area only lost a roof and no exterior walls, which is indicative of EF2 damage. At least one death occurred here. After the tornado moved through the McDonald Chapel area, it moved into the area of Smithfield Estates, with significant home damage along Cherry Avenue between Daniel Payne Drive and Veterans Memorial Drive. Numerous homes sustained damage in this area, and a two-story apartment complex had a large portion of its roof lifted and removed. The damage sustained in this area is consistent with EF2 wind damage. By the time the tornado reached Interstate 65, it was evident that the storm was losing its energy. The damage in the Fultondale area included folded light poles along the interstate and roof damage to the Days Inn on US Highway 31. To the east of US 31, the damage quickly diminished from EF2 intensity to EF1 and eventually EF0. The tornado lifted just to the west of Alabama Highway 79, about two miles north of the city of Tarrant, though the storm was not done. The storm did regenerate itself and eventually put down an EF4 tornado in the Ohachi area. In summary, this supercell lasted about 7 hours and 24 minutes, traveling from Newton County, Mississippi to Macon County, North Carolina, a distance of approximately 380 miles. An hour and a half of that time was when the storm moved through Tuscaloosa northeastward to Birmingham. The supercell produced several strong to violent tornadoes along the way with numerous areas, including Tuscaloosa, receiving EF4 damage. Tornado warnings for counties in central Alabama were in effect from 3.38 p.m. until 8 p.m. Central Daylight Time with this supercell. In total, there were 64 fatalities, including six University of Alabama students, and over 1,500 people were injured. Damage was estimated around 2.4 billion 2011 US dollars. This surpassed the 1999 Bridge Creek Moore Oklahoma tornado as the costliest single tornado in US history at that time. However, this record would be short lived as less than a month later, this number would be surpassed by the Joplin, Missouri EF5 tornado, which caused $2.8 billion in damage. So let's talk about a couple of those bullet points that we just went over at the end. Um, that was a long time for a single supercell to be producing tornadoes first off. Yeah, one supercell lasted about almost seven and a half hours and traveled 380 miles nonstop. That is incredible. And putting down multiple EF4 tornadoes as well. That's, that's right. It's a lot of energy in one storm to be carried from Alabama all the way to North Carolina. So as we touched on there, the 2011 season was kind of crazy for tornadoes, um, especially with this super outbreak being one of the highlights of such a devastating season. However, as we mentioned right there at the end, there was an even bigger tornado that happened just a month later. That's right, and it cost even more than this tornado. So incredible, incredible season for tornadoes that year. It brings up the similarities for me to the 2013 season where you had obviously the destructive EF5 that happened in Moore, Oklahoma, and then just a couple weeks later you had El Reno on top of that. I really enjoy doing these case studies. Yeah, it's very cool to look back at these historical events, even how the weather patterns are different then compared to now. As you may or may not know, 2013 was the last time that we had an EF5 tornado here in the United States, so it has been a long time since we have seen weather patterns as 
devastating and as damaging as these, going from 2011 to 2013, there was a lot of tornadoes in just that two-year span. And it's curious that we haven't seen anything like that here in recent times. That's right. So as of this posting in April of 2024, right. yeah, it's been, what, 10, 11 years since we've seen an EF5 in the United States. Yeah. Now, you might be watching this video three months from now, and who knows, May might bring something <laughs> different. But as for right now, it's very interesting looking at the current weather patterns compared to uh, back then. So there you have it, the April 27, 2011 Tuscaloosa and Birmingham, Alabama EF4 tornado. If you like what you saw, be sure to give a thumbs up and subscribe down below so you never miss another Meteorology Monday. Go ahead and check out our Super Outbreak case study if you want to learn more about the 2011 season. As always, you can check us out on Facebook and Instagram, popping up here if you want to follow along on our weather adventures, especially if we don't post for a while. We are usually posting something on Instagram. So down in the description box, you will find all the links and resources that we use to put together this case study, as well as our School of Weather if you would like to take a little bit of time out of your day and learn about the basics of meteorology or get into a little bit of severe weather topics, if that's something that interests you. We have a series of online courses that goes through that and teaches you in an easy to understand video format and it gives you some PDF guides to follow along as well. If that's something that you would like to check out, it is linked right at the top of the description box. And until next time, I'm Kayla. And I'm Jim. Thanks for watching. And we'll see you at the next Meteorology Monday. That's my creativity for the day. That's why we have everything else written. <laughs>